A stunning admission from former Fox host Bob Beckel. You weren't kidding. You, you really should be dead. I really should be. God knows how many overdoses of drugs I've took. Plus, a biker gang's tough guy. And then I would hope you had a problem with that. Watch what happens when he faces one he can't win. Somebody was going to put a bullet on me for the stuff I was doing on the street. Well, welcome, folks. Terry, when you were in high school, did you play basketball? I uh, know. You didn't? No, I did not. Well, I, I played, but not well. Yeah, well, that would have been me had I played. All right. <laughs> but there was a young man who left high school and then went to the pros, and uh, he just signed a lifetime contract with Nike. And guess how much they're going to pay him for taking that round sphere full of air and putting it into a hoop? I can only imagine in today's world, it's got to be, uh, are we talking seven figures or where are we at? Uh, a lot more than that. Really? 500 million oh, bucks. Oh, my word. LeBron James, he's the ace on the courts these days. $500 million to That's punch a, 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 a round ball through a hoop. So the moral to this story is, is play we should have played basketball <laughs> in high school. Things. That's exactly right. That, yeah. I boxed. You don't get paid anything for that. Listen, <laughs> we might have had to eat our Wheaties and grow a little taller too. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Just maybe. Okay. Well, it wasn't workplace violence. The FBI says the killers in California last week had been radicalized, quote, for quite some time, and they're still wondering why they turned to Islamic terrorism and pledged allegiance to ISIS. Well, meanwhile, terrorism has become a big political issue on the campaign trail, too. And now Donald Trump is proposing to stop all Muslims from entering the United States. Dale Hurd has the story. The FBI says San Bernardino killers 28-year-old Syed Farouk and his 29-year-old wife Tashfeen Malik had spent a lot of time and effort planning the attack that killed 14 of Syed's co-workers. Both subjects were radicalized and have been for quite some time. The couple had taken target practice at an area gun range just a few days before the attack. And the FBI now says 19 pipe bombs were found in the couple's home, not 12 as originally stated. Another sign they were planning terrorism for some time. This new photo shows the pair arriving for the first time in the U.S. as a newly married couple in July 2014. Officials now trying to determine if the Pakistani-born Malik helped radicalize her American husband. In the wake of the San Bernardino massacre, a stunning proposal from Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump. A blanket ban on all Muslims coming into America. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Trump's plan brought immediate condemnation from his Republican rivals. Jeb Bush called him unhinged. Chris Christie called it ridiculous. This is the kind of thing that people say when they have no experience and don't know what they're talking about. Even former Vice President Dick Cheney agreed. This whole notion goes against everything we stand for and believe in. New figures show that since the Paris terror attacks on November 13, the State Department has admitted 237 Syrian refugees into the United States. All were Muslim, except for one Christian. Meanwhile, a leaked 24-page dossier from the Islamic State shows the group President Obama once dismissed as the junior varsity has a sophisticated plan to build a nation with government departments, a treasury, and an economic program. It could be a sign that the Islamic State is getting stronger in Iraq and Syria and that President Obama's strategy to defeat ISIS simply isn't enough to get the job done. Dale Hurd, CBN News. It's an amazing thing, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen, that we have this uh, myopia that has enveloped the White House. He just doesn't see it. He refuses to see it. But these people are terrorists. Now, here's the thing. Like it or not, uh, we have got to crush ISIS 
and unless we crush them in Syria and crush them in Iraq, they will metastasize like cancer and spread all over, and they're very sophisticated. They need to be crushed militarily by overwhelming force. We cannot just drop a few bombs on them and think we'll put them out of the way. There has to be a major commitment about all the nations involved, and Syria has to be dealt with. Whether uh, Assad has got to go or not, that's not necessarily the issue, but something has to be done. That, again, is a cancer right in the middle of, a, of the uh, society that we live in. So it's got to be done, but the president doesn't want to do that. He just doesn't want to do it. He refuses to call this thing Islamic terrorism, and he gives us a tutorial on Sunday about uh, uh, how we should be tolerant. And did you hear Yale, uh, uh, Dale's statistics on that thing? Mosul was a Christian city. ISIS overran it and drove essentially every Christian out of their capital they'd had for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, when we open our doors, 265 or so Muslims come in, one Christian. Who has been persecuted in the Middle East? Christians. It isn't being uh, discriminatory to say these are the victims of terror and they need to be granted a sanctuary, whereas the Muslims have not been. Uh, that, that's a no-brainer. But we'll remain to be seen whether Trump's rather interesting statement helps him in the polls or hurts him. Uh, one of our reporters thinks it'll hurt. It'll help him. I, I, I don't have an opinion on that. We'll find out. Well, while ISIS has been the focus of attention in the Middle East recently, Iran, despite all that treaty that we spent so much time and effort putting together, they've been building up its military, and now they've just tested another nuclear missile in defiance of the United Nations sanctions. Wendy Griffith has that story. That's right, Pat. Iran carried out the missile test in late November, according to what a senior U.S. official told Fox News. The missile can carry a nuclear warhead, and it has a range of 1,200 miles. The test violated two resolutions of the U.N. Security Council, as did a similar test by Iran in October. But so far, the council hasn't done anything, and it's still debating how to respond to the test from October. Well, Christians are used to news of their brethren being massacred and persecuted in the Middle East and elsewhere overseas. But can believers here in the U.S. and other developed countries do anything to stop it? As Paul Strand reports, many experts are wrestling with that question. Some of the most active of advocates for persecuted Christians gathered at Washington's Heritage Foundation to sound the alarm. It is genocide. It is systematic, it is targeted, and it is happening. So can anything actually be done about this? I mean, it seems when you kill some of the persecutors, it just breeds more. That's the purpose of this panel, to discuss, can anything actually be done to stop this martyring of Christians? The panel began with Roger Severino of the Heritage Foundation, quoting this promise from ISIS to Christians. You will not have safety even in your dreams, until you embrace Islam. We will conquer your Rome, break your crosses, and enslave your women. Patrick Kelly of the Knights of Columbus says Syrian and Iraqi Christians can't even escape their killers in refugee camps. The Christians in the camps are being targeted, that, that ISIS and other militias are sending assassins into the camps. All faiths are under attack when one faith tries to kill others because they do not believe. A military solution is possible, but I would say a military solution uh, is, is always a temporary fix. Kelly points out you can't kill every murder-minded really religious really, fanatic. What we have is a, a religious sensibility that, that, that is one of violence. And I think uh, to tackle that is a larger problem, uh, is it, but I don't think it's, it's impossible. Like Nadine Mayanza's hardwired group is trying to stop the killing by changing minds, training one group after another of overseas thought influencers. What we're doing is um, the British government is funding this work, and it's, what we're doing is trying to change the way people perceive religious freedom and, and human dignity in human life. And, you know, we have to be able to counter the ideology that's coming from Saudi Arabia, frankly, that's, that's radicalizing 
Muslims around the world. Our churches are missing in action. Georgetown okay, University's Timothy Shaw says Christian one problem is apathy well, among America's well, believers. If one-tenth of one percent of Christians in America were really outraged and mobilized, we would see political action across the board. Shaw says Christians need to be demonstrating, writing, advocating, demanding action on things like genocide resolutions. It is supremely ridiculous, if I may say, to ask the Obama administration to, to bear the moral weight of this issue when we, we don't. Paul Strand, CBN News, the Heritage Foundation. That is a good question. Can Christians do anything to stop it? Uh, well, I think what we've got to do in terms of Islam is identify what it is. Islam is a political system that is intent on world domination. It isn't a, quote, religion as such. It is a uh, political system masquerading as a religion. <clears throat> and uh, you can call it a religion if you want to, but invariably, when you get to the core of it, it is based on world domination. And again, the world is divided into two parts. It is the uh, world of Islam or the world of the unbelievers. And the unbelievers have got to be converted. And if they won't convert peaceably, they need to be put to the sword. So this is an aggressive uh, military uh, discipline when, uh, bent on world domination. And I think if we begin to realize that we're not dealing with a religion, people say, oh, it's just terrible. You shouldn't discriminate one religion versus the other. Well, yes, you can if one religion is actually a political system that is intent on dominating you and killing you. Uh, Christianity isn't intent on dominating and killing people. It just isn't. It's a peaceful uh, uh, exercise for the soul. It isn't intent on setting up a government with a specific kind of oppressive law called Sharia and uh, territorial ambitions for the entire world. That's what these people want. And I think we've got to recognize that and tell it like it is. Wendy. Pat, turning to presidential politics, Ted Cruz is now ahead of Donald Trump for the first time in the Republican presidential race in Iowa. A new Iowa poll by Monmouth University shows Cruz with 24 percent of GOP support there, while Trump is at 19 percent. Cruz gained steam after earning the endorsement of conservative Iowa Congressman Steve King. Marco Rubio is also gaining traction in Iowa, challenging Trump for second place with 17 percent of support. Ben Carson has fallen back, but he's still in fourth place with 13 percent. But a CNN poll shows Trump with a strong lead over Cruz. The Iowa caucus is now less than two months away. Some good news for Americans hitting the road this holiday season. Oil prices have fallen again, this time to the lowest in nearly seven years. Oil dropped below the key level of $40 a barrel to $37.50. Some experts say that it could eventually fall as low as $20 to $25 a barrel. That could drop the national average for a gallon of gasoline much lower. Right now, it sits at just over $2 a gallon, but in some states, it's as low as $1.80. Pat, why does the price of oil keep falling? <laughs> because the stars aren't aligned to help the <laughs> oil producers. Actually, when the, the pumps are wide open, the Saudis decided that they were going to run their uh, wells full tilt and uh, produce over, uh, well, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million barrels a day. Now, once they did that, they said, we're going to maintain our market share regardless of the price. So the Iranians are coming on board and they said, well, we're going to run ours. And the Iraqis are saying, we'll run ours. And then the Kuwaitis and all the others say, <clears throat> well, if you're running yours full tilt, we'll run ours full tilt. And therefore, uh, we have a glut. And interestingly enough, they were trying to put the shale producers in America out of business. Instead of that, the shale producers say, we can handle it too. And America is producing a, a, in excess of 10 million barrels a day. So there's a worldwide glut of oil, a couple million barrels a day coming out that there's no place to go except into tanks, tankers, or, or storage depots. And 
the price is cratering. It could hit $20, and if it does, it's going to be painful because there will be thousands of people who will lose their jobs. There will be uh, hundreds of uh, oil producers that are going bankrupt. Uh, it will be chaos. And uh, I know if you're driving a car, you say, well, isn't that nice? My, my gasoline's costing a dollar less a gallon. But uh, overall, it's going to be extremely painful. So uh, I just point that out, ladies and gentlemen. Um, one person's gain may be somebody else's loss. Terry. Up next, the liberal former Fox News host who almost drank himself to death because of George W. Bush. I used to wake up and look out my window at the front of my car to be sure there's no blood on it, that I hadn't hit anybody. Bob Beckel explains why he should be dead and what kept him alive after this. Well, Bob Beckel was a star on a program on Fox called The Five. He was a strong Democrat consultant and the so-called liberal on the team. Uh, but as, a, uh, uh, as he explains in his new book, Beckel said, actually, I should be dead. And he spoke with Jennifer Wishon to explain why. Bob, you weren't kidding. You, you really should be dead. I really should be. Yeah, I've been shot and stabbed in a couple car wrecks where people died. Everybody died except for me, and, and uh, God knows how many overdoses of drugs I've taken. In his new book, I Should Be Dead, Bob Beckel explains how he survived politics, TV, and addiction. He took his last drink and drug on January 19, 2001, the night before George W. Bush's first inauguration. Beckel was mad it was Bush, not Gore, who was heading to the White House. And I went down to a uh, biker bar in Southern Maryland, and uh, I was at the bar trying to pick this woman up. She's very attractive. And I felt something behind me, and I turned around. Her husband was there with a 45 caliber right in my face, and he pulled the trigger. And it didn't go off. He hadn't chambered the bullet. Somebody grabbed him from behind, and it blew a three-foot hole in the ceiling. So they threw me out in the parking lot, and just before I passed out, I remember saying, God, I really don't believe, but if you do exist, that's the last drink I'll ever have. He woke up in the VIP room of a Washington psychiatric ward. To add insult to injury, he could hear Bush's inaugural parade while lying in his bed. The story of Beckel's self-destruction to that point is extraordinary. One of only two photos in his new book include his father, a brilliant man who was also a drunk. I came from a dysfunctional family, very dysfunctional, and uh, my father used to find great uh, humor and throwing me down the stairs. And, you know, back then, you went to school and you were all beat up and, and nobody said anything. Bob's passion for politics started as a young boy, first in 1960, watching his father support John F. Kennedy, and later with his dad's involvement in the civil rights movement. Ironically, it was the beatings from the hand of his dad that taught him to thrive in Washington. As a survivor, you learn how to talk fast, cut deals, lie when you have to. Perfect training to be a politician, you know. So uh, when I got out, I did very well in the business and in Capitol Hill, it's full of survivors. The problem is if you don't turn and face your demons, it's going to catch up with you. You arrived in Washington on your birthday, 1972, mm -hmm. with very little money, absolutely no prospects. Mm -hmm. Five years later, you're sitting in the Oval Office briefing President Carter. Mm -hmm. That's extraordinary. Yeah, it is. It is. It's uh, uh, for a guy that grew up the way I grew up. But then, because I didn't have faith, I couldn't figure it out. I kept waiting every day for the Secret Service to come into my office and say, oh, you fraud, get out. <laughs> Throughout his storybook uh, but, uh, career advising really congressional campaigns across the country, Beckel made millions that ended up financing vacation homes for his drug dealers. I used to wake up and look out my window at the front of my car to be sure there's no blood on it, that I hadn't hit anybody. He eventually lost his business, his marriage, and his once flush bank account. There at his lowest point, sitting on a rock in the middle of a field in Maryland, Beckel called out to God. God, I don't know if you exist, and this is probably the worst thing for me to do to ask you the first time out, if you could help me with some money, but I, I'd need money really badly. And uh, this is, was out a mile back on a dirt road. Next day, I went out to the mailbox. It always junk mail. Nobody ever sent me anything. 
And I opened it up, and there was a letter addressed to me, and uh, there was a check inside for 20,000 bucks from a guy that owed me that for 15 years. So I hurried down to the bank. I said, is this city good? And he said, yeah, it's good. It's fine. We'll put it right in. Now, you know, people could say that was just coincidence, but I, I, um, I don't think God's in the business of necessarily doling out 20000 bucks. but I think that, uh, you know, he gives you free will, and including free will is the will to seek faith in him and through Jesus Christ. And if you do that... Um, you will be rewarded for it. I, I believe that. Conservative Personal columnist and friend Cal bottom Thomas bottom? helped lead Beckel to Christ, and reading the Bible right. made him right. rethink some of his One positions. Of come to help. When I came to faith, I, I was on pro-choice boards, you know, and I, I dropped off of those um, because you couldn't read the Bible and be pro-choice. But he still and, considers uh, himself uh, a liberal whole, Democrat. I, mean, I, I still believe that there are, you know, tonight someplace in this city, uh, a child's going to be born to a crack addict mother who, and someplace tonight in this city in the rich suburbs, a white kid will be born to wealthy parents. And I just don't believe they have an equal shot at life. And unless and until I'm confident that everybody has an equal shot at the American dream, then I'm going to remain a liberal in the sense that I do believe that the government has a responsibility, along with charities and others, to, to help that child till they're 18 years old. Now he works with addicts, leading interventions to get people into rehab. It's important for me because it keeps it green, you know. It reminds me of what it was like. It's become his ministry. You know, there's no greater reward, I think, than taking somebody who's terminally ill. Most people get shy away from it, but holding their hands and walking them over to the Jordan and handing them off, you know, to a better place. Digging up his past was hard, but Beckel says unburdening himself is liberating. Now more than ever, he's reveling in a life that's joyous, happy, and free. There was a huge hole in my stomach, you know, I, that I kept filling with drugs and alcohol. And now I fill it with God, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's a much better way to go, and, and he won't make you sick, you know. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Oh, you can't help but love him. What an incredible guy. Uh, the name of the book is, quote, I Should Be Dead. That's a pretty intriguing title. And you can find it online or in bookstores everywhere. They've got it at Amazon. This is Bob Beckel, I Should Be Dead. I think you'll find that very interesting. And, uh, and quite, quite, a, quite a man, uh, extraordinary uh, metamorphosis, Terry. Well, there are, count them, 17 days until Christmas and plenty of time to spread some holiday cheer. Find out how to throw a party the Southern Living Way right after this. Well, if you're hosting a Christmas party this year, you're going to need more than just ironically ugly sweater to wear. Between the food and the drinks and the decorations, it can be overwhelming, even though you want to do it. So Southern Living's Kimberly Whitman is here to help. Take a look. Lifestyle expert Kimberly Schlegel-Whitman is the editor-at-large for Southern Living magazine. She's known for making the ordinary extraordinary with her creative entertaining tips and elegant style. Those ideas are featured in the pages of Southern Living each year. This holiday season, Kimberly shares how you can embellish your home with simple decorating ideas and serve up mouthwatering recipes your guests will love in Southern Living's Christmas Cookbook. Kimberly Whitman is back with us, and we thank you for always joining us with wonderful ideas to make Aww. our celebrating special. Thank you. Tell me, what were some of the great memories you had of growing up with the holidays? Oh, gosh, my parents always made the holidays so special. It's my favorite time of the year. Now I try to do the same thing with my own children, but my mother always gifted us with matching Christmas pajamas <laughs> on Christmas morning. There you are. And she went, there we are. And we, she always asked us to put them on. So we've got my grandmother and my aunt and everyone How and that, cousins and everyone in that photo. So that we makes all Christmas morning with the coffee does. and all the other goodies. We stay really in special. them all day, Terry. <laughs> we don't change. It's not just Christmas morning. I we like don't that. change. Yeah. I like that. You know, I, I know that Southern Living really knows how to do the, this with s such style. And one of the things that they say is that a little bit 
goes a long way. It's Tell true. Me I mean, it's just the little touches and the little things that you do that make your family or your guests or whoever you're welcoming into your home feel special, right? It's just those little things that Absolute, make the, the holidays that people it, remember. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I would really miss if I didn't have this in my house is a fireplace because yes. the mantle at the holiday is just such an awesome place to begin decorating. Yes. And we've decorated our mantle here behind us as as folks can see and it's it's simple but beautiful and elegant you have some special things you're you're working with Dillard's on this that's and right. your products are available at Dillard's tell that's us about right. what we can do as far as the mantle is concerned yes well I think you just need to really embrace your personal style and all you really need to do is focus on your tree and your mantle mm -hmm. and then you can be ready to have a holiday party it really and does make the room warm and, it does and it, welcoming it's a warm gathering place for everyone mm -hmm. it seems to be a spot where everyone collects so just to add a few little touches some greenery and maybe a collection you have around your home mm -hmm. you all have put a beautiful collection of silver pieces and yes. mercury glass up here today um, maybe it's stockings that represent mm -hmm. your family pets or yeah. all of the members of your family or maybe it's a quirky little Charlie Brown style Christmas tree yeah. whatever suits your personal style just to add it to the mantle and put a small collection together gives your guests a really warm gathering Absolutely. place. Absolutely and you kind of do that naturally just with your family but let's work on this a little bit I, I don't can know hear it we, I, I know I can it it's too. It's our low. There we go. Okay. okay. So um, this is a, an onion and apple. Um, uh, they're caramelized and it is such an easy and wonderful thing to put together for your guests if you're having a party. Tell us about how to do that. I wouldn't sure. have thought of those two things as combination. I, I know. Isn't it fun? Yeah. And even the first time I made it, I kind of went, oh, I don't know about that. It is so delicious. And um, so do you want to add the yes. apples? And we've had okay. the onions and some butter uh, in the skillet here for about 10 minutes. Okay. And so you just add in the apples, a little bit of salt and pepper, and uh, you, you just let them sit in the skillet. You want to move them around a little bit for, a, for about another 10 minutes. So it's going to take you about 20 minutes. You can do it the night before your party and well, save it. Absolutely. I like that. Absolutely. And then I always make extra because my husband and my son like it in their scrambled eggs the next Ooh, morning. Yeah, Yeah, it's really, really house. delicious. So it would be a fun thing to do for a holiday party or on Christmas Eve, and uh -huh. then you could have the leftovers on Christmas morning so as well. So this is your finished product. This is the finished product, Beautiful. and you can just serve it over some crackers or toast points or, you know, anything that you like to put out. We, we also have a recipe in the book for some grits crostini, which are fantastic Ooh, mixed with this. Awesome. But you could do store-bought crackers as well. Great. to make it easy. Let's move over here. Something for the kids. Yes. Well, right? I think this is for anyone because I like it too, but it is very <laughs> sweet. Um, this is our Mary Berry mm -hmm. cocktail. Mocktail, I should say. Mocktail, Sorry. Yeah. It's a mocktail. <laughs> and um, basically, we've muddled, and that's why the kids like it so much, is that you're mixing berries, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, agave nectar, and mm. some mint leaves and some lime juice into a shaker or a glass. You could use a mason jar if you mm -hmm. wanted to. And and you muddle it. You just mix it up. You just beat it down like so crazy. Do you, do, so does the shaking do that with this, or do you need? No, to you want to really muddle it. it. Yes, okay. and so that's why the kids like it so much. But it also is fun for a party because you could lay the ingredients and the recipe out uh -huh. for your, you know, frame and the recipe or something, yes. and let them do it. Or you could make it ahead of time. So you're, once you've muddled it, you've got everything in your shaker. You add some ice and some water, and you give it a really good okay. shake, and then you strain it. There's a little strainer in the top of this shaker. You strain it right into the glass, and it's a beautiful oh, berry color. That's awesome. It's very festive, and it's delicious. It is sweet, but but it's really fun. You can give it a try if you want to, I'll do cats then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's yummy, and it's a oh, very festive party fabulous. drink, and it's kind of a nice alternative to a punch, you know, where you can kind of let your guests stay active and, and make it along with Love them. Love that. Now this is beautiful. What is Thank this? Thank you. This is a cranberry pecan chutney and Ooh. it's wonderful for a party because it tastes really delicious um, but also because you can make extra and give it to your guests as a party favor I at the end of the evening. I love takeaways after a special gathering with people. Yeah. You know, they take it home. They remember the time you spent yes. together. It's really wonderful. You've done such a great job decorating these. You just add a little tag. We've attached the recipe here today on the inside as well.
Um, it just, you know, it's just a little special yes. touch. And these are delicious over any holiday meats, you know, hams or yes. turkeys or anything. They're also delicious over crackers or with a cheese plate. The special thing about this recipe is that it has those hot chili flakes in it. Ooh. And it's kind of unexpected. There aren't a lot. It's subtle. And it's really, really yeah. delicious. I want to talk for just a minute as you sure. share all of that about this amazing book. I, I was at Dillard shopping last night. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> that makes me happy. Did you see some of the Southern I Living did. Pieces? I, Great. And I bought a oh, book wonderful. because oh, thank I, it's you. such a great gift for people. Mm -hmm. But what we want to show you is the first half of the book yes. is the Christmas cookbook, That's which right. is absolutely beautiful. And the back half of the book is just year-round celebrations. I mean, how wonderful is that? So in Southern Living, you know, it's not just the food and the wonderful recipes. You also tell us how to present it, how to do it with style, and how to do something that leaves our guests wanting more. This is uh, presented exclusively at Dillard's. It's only $10 with all the proceeds going toward the Ronald McDonald House, so you can't beat that. You get blessed in your blessing at the same time, and mm -hmm. I think you'll really enjoy it. So head to Dillard's, get your book for your friends, and they'll enjoy having both holiday celebrations and year-round celebrations. Thank you for being here. You Thank you so special. much. Merry oh, Christmas Merry Christmas to you. To you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Pat, I'm going to drink your sweet drink because I oh, know good. you don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as they say in the South, you all come here. And uh, that sounds good. Southern living, that's good stuff. Well, still ahead, we've got a guy, he wasn't living Southern. He was living tough. He was a tough guy who met his match. It was a death sentence to me. I had already learned that there was nobody to help me. Hear how this biker beat his biggest adversary when we came back, come back. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Officials are investigating a terrorist bombing in the African nation of Chad over the weekend. Three female suicide bombers blew themselves up, murdering at least 27 people. 90 others were wounded. The terrorists struck at a market on an island in Lake Chad. Officials suspect the Islamic group Boko Haram. Lake Chad is on the border with Nigeria, Niger, and Cameroon, where Boko Haram operates. The attack came just days after troops from Cameroon freed 900 hostages from Boko Haram and killed more than 100 of their fighters. Well, police in Dublin, Ireland are hunting for a masked gunman who robbed worshipers at an evangelical Christian mission. But church leaders say they've already forgiven him. Witnesses say the man used a sawed-off shotgun to threaten about 40 people, including children, on Sunday. The robbery took place at the Compassion Center in one of Ireland's poorest districts. The robber threatened to shoot anyone who resisted and demanded keys for a getaway car. The pastor says the congregation prayed for the gunman soon after he left. He says, we forgive him and we'd like, him, we'd like to see him in church without the gun, hopefully. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, a few years ago, Doug Dodge was given a simple task quote, beat the other guy up. That was his role as the enforcer for a biker gang. And while his fellow bikers wanted him to be a fighter, Doug wanted his gang to be his family. Take a look. People ask me, what, well, what's an enforcer for a motorcycle club do? I can boil it down in one statement. I was the guy that came seeing you when all the talking was over. The satisfaction that I got from fighting was a sense of being able to take care of myself. That was something Doug Dodge learned early in life. He lived in a home with alcoholic parents and an abusive father. His only escape was when the church bus took him and his brother to church. And I remember singing songs about Jesus on this bus. And I remember downstairs in the classroom, there was a picture of Jesus on the wall, and I wanted to just crawl up in that picture and not go home. When Doug was 11, his father shot and wounded a man, landing him in prison. 
but Doug's mother was unfit to care for Doug and his siblings and had to put them into foster care. In one of these homes, Doug was molested. And I did not tell anybody. I had already learned that there was nobody to help me. I felt ashamed and just helpless. Doug decided that the only one that could take care of him was himself. To do that, he relied on the only thing he learned from his dad, how to fight. I remember fighting three times in one day. Um, it was something I did well. That's why my hands are all busted up now. Like his dad, the troubled teenager took out his anger on others. Then at 18, he shot a man during a bar fight. In a plea agreement, he received 15 years for attempted murder. He felt the only way to survive was through violence and intimidation. My reputation in prison was if I wanted something that belonged to you, I would take it from you. And then I would hope that you had a problem with that so I could take even more from you. After serving seven years, Doug was released and joined a motorcycle gang called The Riders. He readily embraced the lifestyle and his role of enforcer. But for Doug, it filled a much deeper need. I hear family. There's a, a group of people that are gonna accept me the way I am and are gonna love me and protect me. All these things that I had never gotten from a family. But after 10 years, Doug became disenchanted. So he left the club and started using meth. It was just to numb all the senses. Here I am, this grown man, and yet again, let down by the world, looking for this uh, family I, I, I so wanted. It wasn't until a friend died from a drug overdose that he decided to go into a drug treatment program. But when the director told them that statistically, one in 20 will stay clean, he became desperate. It was a death sentence to me. I went there knowing, knowing that if I didn't get fixed somehow, I was either gonna kill myself by the stuff I was shooting in my arm, or somebody was gonna put a bullet on me for the stuff I was doing on the street. Doug went home. He remembered those days as a boy in church and prayed to God. And I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I said, but I need some help. And God made a, a deal with me that night. He said, if you'll believe in Jesus Christ, my son, and trust in him, he said, I'll prove to you that I'm in charge. And I was instantly delivered from alcohol, drugs, adultery, everything that the world had uh, offered to me before that day. Doug began reading the Bible and spending time with a Christian neighbor to learn more about God. Four months later, he went to church and professed his faith in Christ. When I was at the altar and I publicly uh, gave my uh, heart to Jesus Christ and accepted him into my life, I felt him say to me, you finally made it to the family that you've always longed to be in. You've, you've arrived. We're gonna give you the love and uh, all the things that you've wanted since you were a little boy. Today, Doug is married to Tanya and has a family. He started a Christian motorcycle ministry called Forged by Fire. If you want a second chance on life, if you want hope, if you want joy, and Jesus Christ is who you need to talk to. The God in heaven, about whom every family on earth is named, he is the Father. He is the family. It is his family that we want to be part of, the family of God. You can be part of a family. You may have been searching for a father. You may have been searching for long lost brothers. You may have been searching for somebody to love you. But God loved you so much, he died for you. And when you get to know him, the time will come when he will fill you so much with love, you can't stand it. It's like an overwhelming experience. The love of God will overwhelm you. And many of the saints of God have testified to that. 
God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Now, you don't have to be an enforcer for some biker gang. You don't have to be a criminal. You don't have to be somebody deep in adultery. You don't have to be somebody who shoots or stabs people. All you have to do is just be a person on this planet who needs a Savior. <clears throat> and Jesus Christ said, I love you. Would you let me come into your heart? And if you do, I will give you a new life beyond anything you can ask or think. Now, what do you have to do? Well, I ask you to pray with me right now. Just ask him. Pray these words, Lord Jesus. That's right, pray with me. Lord Jesus, I know you love me. I know you died for me. I know that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know that you are evidence of God's love. And so, Lord Jesus, I take you as my Savior. And Heavenly Father, I take you as my Father. And I honor you and praise you. And from this moment on, I'm yours. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, thank you. Amen. Now, if you prayed with me just then, I'd like to give you something. It's called a new day. We've had it around for a while, but uh, it has something that's very special. I had the privilege uh, several years ago, as a matter of fact, of going into our audio room and, and making 73 minutes of concentrated teaching about what happens. If anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all has become new. And this will tell you what it is to be reborn. And, uh, and then all the, but the baptism of the Spirit, and what if you sin, how do you get right with God, so it's all there. But more than anything, I want you to call and say, I prayed with Pat, and the Lord Jesus is coming in my heart. 1-800-759-0700, it's a toll-free number. Terry? Well, coming up later, another round of Bring It On. We've got your questions like this one. Douglas says, my wife moved out and took all of our money. I want to take her to court. Is it ever okay to sue someone? We'll answer that question and more, and it's all coming up next. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Over the last few years, millions of Jews from around the world have returned to their ancestral homeland. But for many, that's not an easy journey. So CBN is there to help. Masha Poplovsky moved from Ukraine to Israel, hoping to make a better life for her son, Daniel. It's very hard to raise a child in Ukraine. There aren't many jobs and the war has made things difficult. Being a Jew, I had always heard about Israel and it was my dream to come here. Masha and her son stayed with Ukrainian friends when they first arrived. But the apartment was very small, and the friend soon asked her and Daniel to leave. I was very depressed. I wanted to make it on my own, but I didn't know the language or how to find a job or an apartment yet. I was scared we would have to go back to Ukraine. When CBN Israel learned about Masha, we invited her to come live in the House of Life, a place where single moms who need some extra help can stay free of charge. I was very nervous at first, but the CBN people spoke Russian and made me feel very comfortable. I made friends with the other girls very quickly. We taught Masha how to budget her finances and build a resume. She learned the basics of living in Israel and saved money while staying in the house. We also provided Masha and Daniel with good meals every day. The people there really became my family, and I learned so much in the house. It was a great experience. Masha and her son recently moved into their own apartment. Today, Masha supports Daniel on her own, but we still visit just to make sure they're okay. There is no way we would have made it without your help. This situation in Ukraine is terrible for my baby, so going back would have been horrible. We were only able to stay in Israel because CBN helped us in every way possible. Thank you for that. 
CBN, as you know, is at work around the world, but maybe you didn't know there was a CBN Israel. There is, and we're helping all kinds of people there who are in need. It's all possible because you say we want to make a difference. And so if you're not a 700 Club member today, we want to invite you to join thousands of us who are out to touch the world with the love of Jesus Christ to give people hope and to truly make a difference in their lives. If you'd like to join with us, the commitment is 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and that's just one level. We have many club levels you can join us at, but if you haven't joined us, join us today. There's so many people in need and waiting, and it's so simple to do. You call our toll-free number, it's 1-800-759-0700, or you can call or log on to CBN.com and join with us that way. But when you join, our way of saying thank you for caring about other people is to send you Pat's latest is teaching the transforming word versus to overcome fear and experience peace. In our world today, we all need this. It's the word of God. We want you to have it. So call now. Numbers toll free. The gift is for you, and you'll have the satisfaction of knowing you're changing lives. Okay. You want to bring it on? Well, let's bring it okay. on. Okay. It's questions. time to answer what some of your have? email right, questions. This is Douglas who says, is it ever okay to take someone to court? My wife filed for divorce earlier this year and it will be final on January 4th. But last month she moved out and took all of the money from our joint accounts. We had several agreements to be fair and civil, but she's been very hostile and demanding over the last month. Is it okay to take her to court to get some of the money back? You know, as I read the Old Testament, they had judges set up. The whole, there was a judicial system throughout the country and people who had disputes came to the judges and let the judges decide. And we have a judicial system in this country. People have disputes and they, 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 they differ over the interpretation of contracts. Well, what did you agree to do? Well, I, I agreed to that. No, you didn't. No, you agreed to this. And so you go before a judge, present the, the evidence, and then there's a ruling. Or if you want a jury trial, you put on the circumstances, the jury decides. But that's a peaceful way of settling uh, disputes, and there's nothing wrong with it. As Christians, we really aren't supposed to sue our brothers. But at the same time, uh, God doesn't just want us to be doormats. And in this case, your wife took advantage of you. She stole your money. And uh, I think there's nothing wrong as long as you don't have hatred in your heart. If you have hatred in your heart, it's a bad thing. But if you say, look, I I'm just want to get a resolution of how much is mine because I really need the money. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I, that, <clears throat> having said all that, that's what the Bible says. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, this is Dara who says, I want to begin praying diligently about everything going on right now with our nation. Without complete comprehension of everything we're facing, can you give me a simple explanation and prayer strategy for the United States and Israel? Does it make sense to pray the same prayers daily? It's hard to pray about something so complex that you might not understand, but I definitely am a prayer warrior, so I want to be praying about these important events. The Bible says we don't know how we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit helps our infirmities, and we pray with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I think to get before the Lord and begin to groan for Israel, to cry out for this country, and God Himself will put in your heart the specifics, if there are specifics. But He knows what's in your heart, and He knows you're crying out. You're crying out for an answer. And I tell you, this country is in desperate condition, and it needs intercessors who would cry out. All right? This is Lisa Pat, who says, Please help. My husband is addicted to pornography. Isn't this a form of cheating on me? It hurts me, and he knows this. I feel like I'm being cheated on as he enjoys those images so much. What should I do? Uh, pornography is an addiction. But it's also a type of adultery, because uh, you're having sex with these people. Uh, I think a lot of pornography is frankly just boring, but if, if your husband seems to be enticed by it, that's something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I, I really believe it's a form of adultery, and you don't have to stay in that. It's humiliating to you, it's debasing to you, and uh, I, I think you, it's grounds if you feel so inclined to get a separation and wake him up. But, I tell you, it is a hard, hard addiction. It's every bit as hard as heroin or cocaine uh, to, to, to get free of that thing. And he apparently is, is, is seriously hooked on it. 
All right. This is Debbie who says, my son-in-law and I were reading in the Bible as to what is clean and not clean for us to eat. We're very unclear as to what God wants us to eat that's clean as far as meat. Can you please help us out with this? Yeah, the Bible says Jesus made all foods clean. Uh, that there is no clean and unclean. Uh, if you go back and read what it is, there's certain kind of sh shellfish that are bottom feeders. That they, they feed on garbage. That's why a lot of people have allergies to crabs, for example. They, they eat garbage off the bottom of uh, lakes and uh, rivers and so forth. And that garbage gets into their uh, meat, and then you eat them, and you, 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 you have a reaction to the garbage. And uh, so the Bible says that you should eat f just that which has fins and, sc and scales, because that's what goes through the water and, and, and is clean. It's clean because it's healthy for you. The other brings disease. So that's what it. That's really the main purpose of, the, of those dietary restrictions. I think. Well, we leave you with today's power minute from Psalm 121: The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.